Good morning and welcome back to the Tech 23 Impact Circles. And for those new to the circles, a warm welcome. Thank you all for joining today's conversation on a topic that is changing healthcare, next generation cancer treatments. As is custom, I would first like to acknowledge both the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where the Slattery's team meets, works and creates. We pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Today's conversation will be kindly led by Mike Nichols, and he's joined by Harry Al Wassity, Mary Babawi, Kath Giles, and Michael Hoffman. I'd like to make a special shout out to the Tech 23 sponsors Transport for New South Wales, Main Sequence Cyro Innovation Fund, Oz Industry Entrepreneurs Program delivered in partnership with I4 Connect, Addison, ASX, Ansto, Curtin University, Cicada Innovations, and Evoke AG for making Tech 23 happen. We thank you. Hi, Rachel. Uh, hi, Adina, and hello, everyone, on this Friday morning. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and to especially uh, welcome and thank our contributors who are helping to make these Tech 23 impact circles happen. I want to thank all of you for Zooming in to be part of this circle. Please say hello and introduce yourselves in the chat and you are welcome to ask questions and share your knowledge there as well. The link to the Slattery's Charter will be found in the chat, which is a guide to the behaviour we encourage at all of our our events. Now in its 13th year, Tech 23 has always taken pride in celebrating Australian organisations and individuals who are uh, chipping away at the big challenges we face. There are lots more Tech 23 circles planned for this year and uh, there's lots of past circles that you can find on the website and watch at your leisure. Uh, and also we've got a face-to-face -face event to look forward to uh, on the 15th of oh. December in Sydney. Please note today's circle will be recorded and just confirming that we get to eavesdrop on this wonderful conversation and then move to Q&A uh, and then afterwards you are welcome to come off mute and connect and chat. Uh, I'm so honoured and very grateful for uh, Mike uh, leading this circle and I ask him now to kick things off. Hello Mike. Hey, good morning, Rachel. Thank you very much, Adina. I would also like to acknowledge the um, uh, traditional owners of the land of, uh, on which we record this across the country. Um, my name is Mike Nichols. I'm one of the partners at Main Sequence Ventures. Um, uh, we are the CSIRO Innovation Fund, or should I say we manage the CSIRO Innovation Fund with roughly $500 million under management, trying to help Australia's researchers actually turn their technology into large businesses. Um, this is a pretty personal um, uh, panel for me today because, as some of you may know, um, four years ago this month, I was actually diagnosed with stage three cancer, uh, head and neck cancer. And so I went through the process that we're about to describe in some ways and have lived through many of the horrors of this situation. So I'm, I, it's an area which is near and dear to my heart, and I'm sort of happy to have met these researchers and, and founders along the journey and what you know, the, the, the mission they're on to try to improve the life of people that are being diagnosed with cancer. Um, so it might just be worth us very briefly discussing you know, the, the, the types of um, uh, treatments that happen. I mean, if you think about it, cancer is not one disease, although many think of it as that. It's actually hundreds of, or should I say, more than a hundred different types of cancer some similarities between some of those, but they're all different diseases. And every cancer patient has a different journey. Um, typically, they will have symptoms of some sort. They'll have an examination. They may have a biopsy. They may have imaging, diagnosis, and staging, and then finally treatment. Um, and, and those diagnostics can be mammograms, x-rays, biopsies, MRI, CT, PET scans, and then surgery. Pretty primitive, although some machines like the Da Vinci robot um, surgeon have been introduced, but they still seem to be mostly being done manually by humans. Um, radiation, although um, there's been many improvements in this, this is a technology that came from the 1900s. Uh, if we think about chemotherapy, first work on chemo treatments really came from observations around mustard gas in the First World War and its effect on white blood cells. The, the treatment I got 
only sort of three and a half years ago with cisplatin. That was first discovered in 1893 and FDA in 1978. Um, so it really depends on the type of cancer and the staging um, uh, of the, the patient. And patients may have one or numerous types of different treatments. And to be frank, some of those can be pretty brutal. So I want to sort of start off here and have a chat with Mary and say, Mary, give us your background. Tell us what you do at UTS. Um, give us your background and tell us about liquid biopsies and work you're, you're currently researching. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to the Slattery Group for this uh, wonderful invitation. It's a great event. Um, so, Mike, I guess my background is in cancer multidrug resistance. I started this work in the mid 90s um, and it's an area that I feel is understudied despite the fact that it has been decades of research in this space. It's a very difficult area to manage clinically um, and multidrug resistance is basically the simultaneous cross resistance to a wide range of structurally and functionally unrelated drugs that are used in the treatment of cancer. So in now, other words, they've actually been treated, but it didn't work or they've become resistant. Is that right? That's right, Mike. And it's not just a resistance to one class of drug. It is actually a wide range of different drugs. And the, the mechanism behind that is the overexpression of what you would call, you know, uh, drug pumps. These are proteins that sit on the surface of a cancer cell. And effectively, these are highly promiscuous drug pumps, drug transporters, and they recognize a wide range of different molecules. To this day, we don't understand how single proteins can manage the interaction and the efflux of uh, the pumping out of um, a wide range of drugs. And so this is a challenge that has occupied my research for decades now. Um, and I guess, um, Mike, you mentioned I have a personal, um, I guess, interest in this because uh, in the 90s, I, I had three family, very close family members pass away from cancer. And my aunt in particular, who was in her 50s, um, had metastatic breast cancer, was on a wide range of different high dose chemotherapeutics. And during her treatment, I could visually see the cancer coming back. I, I, I actually saw it come back. She pointed it to me. And that really um, has impacted my life and uh, in, uh, really drives what I'm doing. So I guess you're looking for signs of multi-drug resistance. Um, when we talk about you know, the, the concept that many people can get their head around is a liquid biopsy. Mm. Tell, tell me what that is and how it works and what you're looking for. Yeah, so a liquid biopsy is just that. It is a biopsy, but in the liquid form. And, and by saying that, it could be a blood test, it could be a urine test, or it could be a saliva test. Um, so it's basically sampling biological fluids and assessing that fluid for signs of, you know, uh, malignant presence. And tumours, uh, the way we can do that is that tumours shed a wide variety of different particles uh, in the peripheral circulation. So you've heard of circulating tumour cells, exosomes and other uh, larger vesicles, microvesicles, which is what we uh, uh, start study in terms of our liquid biopsy, and also circulating tumour DNA. All of these comprise what we refer to as a tumour circulome. And so we can um, take advantage of this and by detecting these particles and measuring these particles, it provides us a measure uh, which uh, supports uh, diag diagnosis of disease, but also prognostication. So when we think about traditional diagnosis, typically um, we can be looking at, um, initially people start feeling, depending mm. on what cancer it is, um, yes. imaging, and then sometimes a biopsy, um, in some cases, especially in blood-based cancers, um, the biopsy is not going to tell you much, is it? Because there isn't, unless it's gone metastatic, there isn't actually a tumour anywhere yet. Yeah. Um, and so um, you're essentially picking up signs that the cancer cells have passed off the vesicles mm. and you're measuring those. And in, in particular, you've been focusing on multiple myeloma. Yes. It might be just worth sort of talking yes. about 
what multiple myeloma is and why it's so insidious as oh, a disease. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's probably worth sort of discussing that and then mm. how that sort of may play into a bigger picture on being able to detect all or many cancers um, via a liquid biopsy. Yes, thank you, Mike. Um, so I was drawn to multiple myeloma in 2012, actually. Um, so again, my interest in multiple myeloma stemmed from my research in multi-drug resistance. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of bone marrow plasma cells. And this is a very nasty malignancy. It's got, it has a very poor survival. Survival rates about 46%. Um, and so this is, a, this is essentially a cancer confined to the bone marrow. So the, the existing ways of diagnosis and um, monitoring for disease progression is a number of different, I guess, blood tests, but these blood tests are limited because they are essentially uh, valuable once the tumour has reoccurred. The gold standard test in multiple myeloma is the bone marrow biopsy. This, of course, is very invasive, but um, in addition to that, it's problematic because of sampling bias. So basically, this is a cancer that is spread throughout the entire axial skeleton. It comes up as multiple thousands of different clones, and each clone is different to one another. And so sampling one point of the skeleton does not capture that, that tumor heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. And so for me, and, and the other thing with multiple myeloma, the significant problem is that patients frequently uh, go through episodes of remission and relapse and ultimately are completely drug resistant, um, uh, drug unresponsive. And this is a clinical manifestation of multi-drug resistance. And so for me, this was an ideal cancer model to study in the context of multi-drug resistance. So for us, we developed, the, there was certainly an unmet clinical need. There is no blood test that can detect multi-drug resistance in myeloma or in any other cancer. And so we did start with my, multiple myeloma. And, and to our surprise, uh, we were monitoring for the presence of extracellular vesicles that are shed from the malignant plasma cells within the bone marrow compartment. And we detected vast numbers of vesicles in the bloods of myeloma patients with a tremendous diagnostic capa um, capability. I mean, our, our initial studies showed an AUC of our receiver operator curve analysis of 0.97. So this is quite... Uh, it has a strong diagnostic capability. So, so just to be clear, you've run um, our testing diagnostic, diagnostic work on over 100 patients now, I believe, um, that we know are suffer actual sufferers. And you've been able to successfully test those and have had a 97% diagnosis rate. Is that what I'm yeah. understanding? Yeah, well, we've, we've monitored 70 patients and we've then followed 15 patients longitudinally. We're now expanding the study um, across multiple sites, including international sites. And we've established collaborations with the Myeloma Centre at Cornell University, as well as um, IRST, which is a huge myeloma centre in Italy, and the National University of Singapore, as well as numerous sites here um, nationally. Um, so yes, we have um, established, I guess, proof of principle in terms of the, this, the strength of the uh, diagnostic capabilities in quantitating the, these microvesicles. We also, our test also provides for phenotyping. So we can then look at these vesicles and monitor, sort of gauge the proteins that are on the surface of these vesicles. And we've identified a proprietary multidrug resistance signature, which then we have... Um, been able to associate with progressive disease and treatment failure. Again, that shows uh, excellent diagnostic potential. And so, so that's basically where we're at. So, so I think if we sum that up, um, you have proven um, uh, you've got diagnostic capability mm. and you've shown that in real patients. Yes. Um, but more importantly, because multiple myeloma is such a recurring scenario and yes. you know eventually um, it comes back and keeps coming back you've identified the ability to find uh, or diagnose recurrence much earlier than it otherwise would have been able to be found right yes 
Absolutely which, which not. gives you yeah. a whole bunch of options that you may not have had otherwise. That's so right. what, what's the potential for this going forward? So can we see that ability to detect multiple myeloma vesicles? Can we see that applied to other cancers as well? Yes, yes, certainly. And what we're excited about is that this is a platform technology. Multidrug resistance impacts pretty much every cancer and it, it, it impacts survival and, um, and treatment success in every cancer. And so for us, um, the next step would be, I guess, once we've uh, done the work in multiple myeloma or to expand in other malignancies. The exciting thing about this technology also is that it provides a capabilities in molecular characterization of disease. And so on, in terms of my plan, in addition to the diagnostic, we aim to develop targeted therapies based on what we're finding from our, our, diagnose, our diagnostic. And so this diagnostic I see, uh, in addition to it standing on its own, would also serve as a companion diagnostic for targeted therapies in the future. Fantastic, Mary, thank you. Thank um, you, Mark. I I'm going to switch over to um, Dr. Kath Giles, um, CEO of OncoRes. Kath, are you, can you hear me? Hi, Mike. Uh, how are you going? I want to thank you very much. Kath's in Perth. And so you're out. The sun's probably not up yet, is it? You're um, very, very early. Thanks so much for joining, uh, joining us um, so early in the morning. Um, oh, so you're, you're an ex-venture capitalist, and, and you've actually made the jump back to operating. How did you become the CEO of a medical devices company? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so my background originally as a doctor and I continue to work um, in surgery alongside surgeons until recently. Uh, and I've um, yeah, worked for both Stonebridge Ventures and then Brandon Capital. And so I first saw the technology in my role as an investment manager at Brandon Capital back in 2013. And for me, it was love at first sight. This we've developed at Oncarez Medical. We're developing a brand new imaging technology to help surgeons improve or to help improve cancer outcomes by helping surgeons get all of the cancer out during the first surgery. And so, so tell us about that. So tell us what happens there. So we get a diagnosis: a, a patient may do a mammogram or, or some form of imaging. Yeah. And then what happens? Yeah. So. Um, surgery is the foundation of curative treatment for pretty much all solid cancers, and there are about 17 million diagnoses of those a year. So in breast cancer, you, you'll go in and have a mammogram and an ultrasound and then a biopsy. And when the cancer is being diagnosed, generally, the first step is surgery. There's some changes now with people perhaps having chemo first, but the, as I said, the foundation of curative treatment is to try and get as much of that cancer out as possible. Um, because that produces the best outcomes. So despite, um, and um, there are two options for surgery for breast cancer. One is a mastectomy, which is full removal of the breast, and the other is a lumpectomy, which is where they remove all of the cancer and a small rim of healthy tissue around it. Um, lumpectomy is the treatment of choice. Uh, and with diagnoses, um, breast cancer diagnoses happening earlier and with smaller tumours, more and more women are able to have a lumpectomy to remove their cancer. Uh, unfortunately, despite the age that, uh, the, despite the fact that we live in an age where technology rules our lives, surgeons still rely on their sense of touch to determine that they've got all of the cancer. And as they're looking for less than a millimetre of tumour through at least one set of surgical gloves, it's really unsurprising that cancer is missed. And it's missed about 40% of the time. And they don't discover the fact that they haven't removed all of the cancer until three to seven days after the surgery, when the pathologist looks at the excised lump under the microscope and determines that there's cancer too close to the edge. So effectively what we've got here is we've got surgeon in surgery um, uses their finger to detect the stiffness, if you like, of the, the uh, tumor cell, but at a really small um, uh, scale, you're not going to detect that if it's really tiny. But what your device does is allows them in real time to be able to image that cancer, right? And to be able to see that they've um, taken enough margin out to ensure that they haven't left anything that's visible there in the, in the, in the breast. Absolutely. So um, 
you've hit on a, the most important point, I guess, which is cancer is well recognized to be stiffer than healthy tissue from the cellular level up to the macroscopic. That's why we can feel a lump um, when a cancer develops. And that's what the surgeon capitalizes on with their finger. So that's what our technology capitalizes on. So we've combined two known imaging technologies and I can- Yeah, show, show us the screen. You can my you screen can... if I can get my- yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, we normally uh, don't do live share screens, but we've decided to do today because it is such a complex topic. The visualization actually helps. So hopefully you can see the, yeah, we're live. the yeah. um, presenter screen. I mean, the yeah display screen. So the R technology combines the two known imaging technologies. So optical coherence tomography, which is similar to ultrasound, but it uses light waves. So it's, it can see tissue microarchitecture. And we combine that with microelastography, which is a quantitative measurement of tissue stiffness. So we produce images of tissue stiffness on a micro scale. Um, surgeons will be able to use our probe inside the surgical cavity where they previously used their finger. And then they'll get images up on a screen and they can look at those and determine whether or not cancer remains inside the patient. Fantastic, because right now what ends up happening, if you're really lucky you're in one of the super cancer hospitals like Peter Mack or um, uh, Chris O'Brien, they may have somebody to run it down to a, a lab and get somebody to have a quick look at the cells on the top spot, on the spot. But most hospitals don't have that ability. And as you say, they end up finding out six or seven days later when it's been through the pathology and the pathologist has said, oh, wait a minute, we've missed some, um, which ends up resulting in another operation later on and perhaps more progression of disease as we go. Yeah, absolutely. So if they don't get all the cancer out, the women are twice as likely to have a local recurrence uh, and which sends the majority of those women back to surgery. So we, we know that between 17, we know 30% of Australian women will have to have a re-excision surgery for um, failure to remove all of the cancer. In the US, it's somewhere between 17 and 35% but it is completely surgeon dependent as well. So we've got papers that say it's between next to zero and 91%. So there's massive surgeon variability um, and it's a really significant problem. And if you even just look at an average of 22% of patients in the US have to have re-excision surgery, it creates $700 million of unnecessary surgery every year in the US alone. It's been noted as one of their real issues for their um, by the Medicare system in the US or, um, that they need to address, particularly surgeons who have a greater than 30% re-excision rate. And, and for the patient, I think one of the, you know, very importantly for us, it's got massive impacts on the patient. So aside from the fact that they get um, more likely to get complications from the second surgery, like infection, they also delay their subsequent treatments, which is bad for prognosis. Uh, and 30, somewhere between 30 and 50% of them will choose a mastectomy the second time. So it's a complete divergence from the course that they'd chosen. Yeah. And I think most importantly, they've lost, the surgery happens very rapidly uh, in most cases after diagnosis. Their world's already been completely shattered by the diagnosis. Yeah. And then there's failure at the first treatment. And so that really impacts their, um, you know, it creates a lot of anxiety for patients and families. And often that anxiety, talking to patients, lives well on after they've been given the all clear from cancer and finished their complete treatments. And five years later, they'll, you know, we've had patients say to us, the one thing that keeps me up at night is I wonder, should I have had a mastectomy the second operation or should I, you know, I chose just to have, the extra um, an extra lumpectomy if they didn't know that they got it all out the first time how do they really know they got it all out the second time yeah so we're hoping with our device that we can give patients and surgeons confidence that all the cancer has been removed the first time and, and so primarily focused on breast initially but presumably you'll be able to translate this into other um, uh, disease types as we go forward yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, we're really excited about that. So we're looking forward to um, investigating other cancers. Uh, as I said, touch is used um, broadly across different, um, different cancer subtypes. So, and there, you know, for example, in lung cancer, 
Whilst in breast cancer, you know, mortality rates are pretty good, our treatments are reasonably good. In lung cancer, they're not. Lung mm. cancer is the most common cancer across men and women globally. And there is a very um, high correlation between not getting all the tumour out and poor outcomes on survival rate. So, um, and they don't sort of go back and re-excise there. And then in prostate yeah. cancer, um, you know, one of the really important things is can you spare the nerves? So, yeah. yeah, our technology will be able to be applied in different ways to solve different problems, but across the board in other solid cancers. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Harry, I might switch to you. Are you there? Um, Kath, if you could switch yeah. sharing your screen. Thanks so much. Hi, Michael. Hey, Harry. Thanks so much. Um, now, this is the area that I probably know the least about, but I will say that um, mRNA seems to have been the hero of 2021 um, in its role with the, um, uh, the, the treatment of COVID or the vaccination mm -hmm. and preventative of COVID. Um, maybe you can sort of describe a bit about what it is, what it's working on, what, what you're working on, and what's being investigated in the use of mRNA as a, both a therapeutic and potentially a vaccine as well for cancer. Yeah, and um, yeah, let me start by saying thank you so much for inviting me um, to this panel today. And, you know, I think, you know, hearing um, from uh, Mary and Kath has been just fascinating to, to know um, all these new technologies. And I think, you know, mRNA has emerged um, uh, spectacularly well as a vaccine in 2020. And um, um, what mRNA is basically, it's, um, it's just short for a messenger RNA. And um, it's uh, basically a template to make a protein, to make an antigen. Um, in the case of the COVID-19, we really selected, uh, select an antigen uh, found on the coronavirus that then the immune system will raise um, antibodies, but also raise an, basically a, a, a complete immune a response uh, against it that can protect uh, from, from future infections. Um, but really just be, beyond that, going back, say, a few, few years, and, you know, mRNA has been used and tried to be applied for, for different diseases. And the thing is about it is that it's, um, uh, with, with each different application, you really, technology is not the same. There's a bit of differences to that uh, from, say, trying to apply it to, to the cancer and trying to apply it to, to something like an infectious diseases. And what I really come from, I actually, you know, I, we don't, uh, we're, we're not, I'd say, clinicians, or we don't, we don't work necessarily on the cancer itself. We technology developers, so we work a lot with um, people who work on diseases and applications. So we've recently been developing um, um, a kind of a, a candidate COVID vaccine for for future mutants, and we work with the Daughtry Institute and um, collaborate uh, collaborated on that to. To develop a vaccine and is currently kind of in, under development to, towards clinical trials. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, the cancer has been really a, a kind of a passion of mine trying to develop a technology. And the reason for that is the complexity of it. And it really, for the cancer immunotherapy or what we call, like to call it a personalized uh, vaccine is probably the same thing. So if I can show you, if I can probably just share quickly. Yeah, please do. My, yeah. Um, I hope that you can see yep. all of that. Yeah. So really, you know, it's it's about um, targeting uh, what we call antigens that are found in cancers or uh, can arise from uh, the tumors, um, uh, you know, spontaneously. So we call those neoepitopes or other antigens that are found, for example, in, in melanoma or, or cancer or colorectal cancer. So, so just to describe what the antigen is. So there's a few antigens um, that are associated with uh, the melanoma. So um, uh, just uh, call them tumor-associated antigens. So they're found uh, uh, in the in the tumors uh, in the uh, the melanoma, for example, itself. Um, and the idea is that we then scan for those antigens by working with with clinicians and working with people who have studied those antigens. And scan and see what, what sort of the tumor, how much does it have? If it has that antigen in abundance, then what we basically can do is then form a vaccine against that antigen. 
which when then can, can administer to people. So it really works just in a similar fashion to what we call uh, you know, an infectious disease. But in this case, it's, a, it's an antigen that's found um, uh, either in, in tumors or, um, uh, or arise spontaneously. So we call those neoepitopes. So they're just simply mutations that we, uh, that we think that they could uh, become immunogenic. So we can basically vaccinate against them. So, so, okay, so immunogenic means that you have an ability to then be able to target against that in a proactive way. Is that what we're saying? Yes, correctly. Correct. And, and the idea of that is we call this a therapeutic vaccine uh, because instead of, you know, protecting against, um, uh, you know, say melanoma, we treat patients that already have the melanoma. So we would raise the immune response against those antigens that are found in the cancer. But obviously there is a real hope that then this becomes most, most also extend beyond that and becomes protective particularly if you have an immune, have raised an immune response against those antigens. So then, you know, the tumor arise again, there's, a, there's at least some, some immune response can, that already exists um, that can, you know, kind of attack the tumor again. Uh, but this is definitely way down the track. And, and I think there hasn't been any clinical evidence of that is, is you know, kind of possible. Um, so yeah, so you know, our role really has been mostly on developing the technology. So basically, how can we quickly, or how can we select the antigens themselves, um, build them in a way that they could produce the best immune response, the signature immune response that is important for cancer, um, and which is a bit different than what we what we want in a in a viral or pr pr protective vaccine. And you know, we've been working with. Um, we started working some time ago. Um, in you know in uh, preclinical models with few researchers in breast cancer and, and, and melanoma, um, and then now we're trying to also build that into um, uh, into into more of a clinical kind of uh, potential. Especially now we have a capacity in Victoria to potentially kind of build a clinical quality mRNA. So this is the sort of challenges we're, we're currently facing. Um, but you know, we love working with other people, love working with, with clinicians and with great scientists who, who spend their lives on these, um, on these different molecules. And um, you know, I think the goal is through how we can we converge the two to build a therapeutic platform that we can then select and, and target the cancer. So, so would I be right in saying part of your role is very much sort of bioinformatics, so to speak? Are you correctly trying to identify the right antigen on which you might actually uh, target uh, a therapy? Is that the, the, the general scenario? Do you go through and, and look at the, the, the breakdown of cancer um, as sequencing, big cancer as sample banks? How, how, do, how do you actually find that antigen? So it, it may be just... Uh, we, we, we mentioned antigens before, but maybe just sort of explain exactly what it is. So it's a protein, peptide. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it exactly? It's expressed on a cell. Is that the correct? Yeah. So you know, there's a there's a few. So the the cast the models we we've been using working with with the researchers. You know, there are basically um, you know uh, preclinical models. So there are antigens called uh, tyrosinase, for example, in the um, and the melanoma, there's tyrosinase, um, which is an antigen known to be found in melanoma in, in mice and sometimes in humans as well. Um, there's other ones called TRP1s, TRP2s. And I think one of the, so our role really is to, it's, it's not the sequencing and the identification of this um, uh, antigen, but actually building the technology and the delivery vehicles and then testing them with the researchers and, and really optimize that, then we can take that to the clinical trials. Um, obviously with the, with the humans, there are other several ones um, that uh, we think there could be a potential and we know kind of working with uh, some of the clinicians to identify those antigens, um, uh, particularly antigens that could, you know, uh, tumor associated antigens that found in melanoma and, and other antigens as well. Um, and, you know, the goal is to try to translate that in humans and, and test, test those as well. So there, are, there is a, in Europe, there's a, a clinical trial um, by uh, also a biotech company who targeting tyrosinases, targeting other um, uh, antigens that called tumor associated antigens. 
um, using the mRNA, their mRNA platform. So there, and there's, you know, there's an interesting result coming out of that, but there hasn't been a, a fully approved product on that. We haven't got a breakthrough as yet. There's no breakthrough drug is what we're saying. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you think about the typical cancer treatment, um, and I can speak from this great experience, there's an enormous amount of off-target problems or side effects that you get from a cancer treatment. You know, radiation, chemo, surgery, they all have massive, in some cases, massive um, off target uh, side effects and ongoing issues that you have to deal with. If we target the antigen, we sort of get the advantage that we're only hitting the cell that has the antigen, which is the cell that is um, yeah. cancerous, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, I think, um, you know, realistically, obviously, there will be a combination. So, so one of the advantages of um, having a personalized, say, cancer therapy is you're really specific against the antigen that is found for each patient. Um, you're really not, you know, kind of overloading the system with an, you know, entire, you know, kind of a chemical that is you know, going to kill some healthy cells and the cancer cells. But we're really bringing it down to a specific um, antigens that then you can mount an immune response. But we've also been seeing that that's actually this type of therapeutics, uh, particularly in some of the phase one clinical trials and the animal models that we, some of them done here with, uh, when we're working with some of them and with Peter Mack as well is that they, they really actually, this type of therapy just works really well um, in um, adjacent to say uh, existing uh, immunotherapies, which basically entirely stimulate the immune system on a basically on a larger scale. So there's a really good synergy here to, it's not an either or, but it could be, especially with mm -hmm. the immunotherapy, it could be, you know, an additional combination that, yeah. Yeah, that you really are uh, more, uh, you know, uh, added benefit to, to the kind of an existing therapeutics. Um, but it's still, early, it's still early in its development. And that's kind of our level at this stage is to try to build a, say, a, 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 a platform that's, that's possible for human use. And then, you know, kind of try a few of those antigens, um, you know, working with clinicians. And I think our approach has been, especially when we're hearing from clinicians, actually, some people we work with from the Austin Hospital. Um, and, you know, we love working with other people because then they, especially cancer clinicians, so know much more than we, we know about this. But, you know, I think the approach now seems to be more of an antigenic approach. So, you know, we look at, we, we, we you know, we can select few types of cancer, but then we really look at which, which antigen um, uh, of those, you know, that can arise from any of those and, and target that. So, you know, it's, it's becoming a more of a disease uh, agnostic, but more of if the antigen is there in the cancer, um, we can probably try to target that. Of course, we still don't know if that is, is a possibility. Oh. But when it's broadened the horizon beyond just, you know, a singular, a singular cancer type, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much, Harry. Um, I might flick over to um, Michael. Michael, Michael, are you there? Have you got yes, your screen? How are you? I'd like to introduce um, Michael Hoffman, winner of the 2018 Medical Imaging Award of the Year for his work on treatment of metastatic prostate cancer with theranostics. Um, in fact, I think it might have just been image. No, but that actually is treatment, isn't it? You can see behind me the image on my screen. Um, Michael, tell us, um, radiopharmaceuticals have been in use for decades for thyroid cancer, but haven't been used widely. Um, but it's a pretty hot space right now. Um, maybe explain to the audience what a theranostic is and how it differs from traditional cancer treatments, especially around on-target, off-target, and sort of uh, precision targeting. Um, why is this so hot now, right now? What, what is it you're working on? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So I'm a nuclear medicine doctor at Peter Mac, and we're working in this space called Theranostics. And maybe a way to conceptualize it is, I mean, you've had radiation therapy to your, I think- 65 grays, Michael. Yeah, it was a big, big load. It was a big dose of radiation. So yeah. the way that was given is, you know, you sat on a bed and a large machine just sort of, irradiated the area That's right. and that irradiated both the tumor but also all the muscles and all the soft tissue which you didn't really want to irradiate around the tumor uh, so it was confined to an area and uh, if your tumor had already spread to other parts of the body that's not an effective approach 
Yeah. Here, we're using the same method, radiation, to kill tumor cells, but we're giving it as an injection intravenously into a vein, much like any other drug. Uh, and we're using molecules that will attack the cancer cells specifically, but has a radiation payload attached. So in prostate cancer, prostate cancer cells express a particular protein on their cell surface called PSMA or prostate specific membrane antigen. And what we've been doing at Peter Mac is labeling some small molecules, little, tiny protein, uh, a little bit like a key to a radioactive substance. And we can use these both for imaging and therapy. And that's a key part of Theranostics is that it's both an imaging test, like a scan, which we can use to see, well, how far has the cancer spread? And we can also then use it as a treatment. And the way we do that is just by changing the type of radiation. So for the scan, we use a radioactive molecule called gallium-68 or fluorine-18. And that radiation is taken up into the tumor cells. It's emitted from the body like an X-ray. And when you go into the PET scan, we get a picture like you see on the top of this screen. But that substance has no effect on the body. It's purely for imaging. And then if we want to treat, we change to a high sort of killing power radioactive substance. And the main one we've been using is called lutetium-177. And the lutetium uh, travels only one millimeter, unlike the diagnostic radioactive substance, which travels sort of out of the body, is detected by the scanner. The lutetium is taken up into the tumor cells, travels only one millimeter. So for your head and neck tumor, you know, it would have been much better for you if we had such a substance that doesn't unfortunately exist for head and neck tumors, where we inject it, you would have got a similar gray dose. Actually, with our radioactive molecules, we can get as high as sometimes 200 gray from a single injection. But with that very short path length, one millimeter, it's really targeted to the tumor. So it might be worth just popping that slide up again, Michael. Um, one of the most amazing things to me, Mike, you want to, Michael, you just want to share? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Again? I'm going to switch um, to the next one. Oh, okay, perfect. So this is the, the image that won the 2018 Medical Imaging Award. Essentially, what you see on the left-hand side of each of these squares, the eight squares, is a metastatic cancer patient, cancer patient um, that has cancer all through their body. If you are a patient and you see an image like that, it is, I, I'd imagine, I, I'd, mine was nowhere near like that, but I'd imagine it would be um, a horrific scene to see that. On the right-hand side of each of those boxes is the patient that's been treated after how many doses, Michael? Yeah, this was after four doses of lutetium PSMA. And uh, so this is a clinical trial. We did it, Peter Mac, actually the first prospective trial of this treatment anywhere in the world. And we took men with prostate cancer who really had no other options. They'd had chemotherapy, hormone therapy. They were going to go to palliative care. They were really dying. And we gave them this experimental treatment. And even in that sort of third, fourth, last line setting, we saw these extraordinary responses, but each image is, is a patient and you can see how clear the, these PET scan images are with the PSMA. So we're coupling the same molecule for both imaging and therapy, and that's very powerful. But more importantly, the quality of life of these men improved a lot. A lot of these men had a lot of pain. You can see the pattern of spread predominantly to bones and that causes pain, keeps you up at night. You're on high dose opiates and other forms of pain medications that's making you dopey. And then after the treatment, your quality of life has improved. You know, some people were almost bed bound and uh, after the treatment, they were back, you know, mowing the lawn. It was quite remarkable. So you really can't treat a patient with this sort of cancer with surgery or radiation or chemo in an effective way, right? You literally can't give them the radiation they need off a traditional um, beam radiation machine, a, a LINAC. You literally can't apply it to somebody that's got metastatic cancer like that because it's basically going to kill them the amount you would need, right? Correct, correct. So this is both, this is very targeted. And I just want to show you another slide. The ability to visualize what we're treating is really powerful because this treatment's not suitable for everyone. So this is another patient with prostate cancer that's spread very widely. And we've done two types of PET scan here. The one on the left being the PSMA PET the one in the middle being a sugar PET scan. It shows tumors that are growing very quickly. And then on the right, a hybrid image where I've just color coded. So in blue is the prostate cancer that has the PSMA that we can target. And in red 
is prostate cancer that's lost its PSMA for whatever reason. And we can see that, yeah, we can target maybe three quarters of the tumor, but the other quarter we can't target. So we would think that that's not good. So we would avoid the lutetium PSMA in this patient since we can't target all the disease. That's pretty unique because most cancer treatments, you just sort of flip a coin, you try the chemotherapy, will it work or not? Mm. Here we can do a scan to see, is that target expressed and is it expressed everywhere in the body? Because often treatments are driven by a biopsy. Yeah. And when you biopsy a single site, it's misleading because if you biopsied five sites, you'd find different things. And it's got some analogies to the liquid biopsy where we saw Mary present earlier. And I think, you know, liquid biopsy and these whole body tumor scans are really very complementary and give us very different information. And I think part of the future is also not just these advances in treatments, but selecting the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're working on a prostate cancer version, which has just gone through FDA approval, I believe, um, and, but it has actually been in um, clinic here in Australia under the special access scheme via, I think, um, a Genesis Care, I think has been running trials, is that correct? And somebody else? Yeah, look, there's multiple groups ar around Australia that have been uh, running trials in this domain. I can actually, uh, oh, I'll show you a slide of one of them. But we, we actually, through uh, Academic Network and Peter Mack, ran the first randomised trial of this treatment anywhere in the world. And we ran it at all these hospitals around Australia. And it was a great collaboration of radiation oncology, medical oncology, and uh, it, it was fantastic. And Medical trials running in this network around Australia. Uh, so wow. that's pretty good. So we saved a whole bunch of um, people from dying essentially with this, or at least extended their life and quality of life quite significantly. Yeah. So in the trial we ran, we compared the lutetium PSMA to a chemotherapy. The chemotherapy was called carbazitaxel, and we showed a response rate of 66% for the lutetium compared to 37% for the kind of standard of care chemotherapy. So roughly double the response rate, but more importantly, the side effects of the lutetium were much less uh, than chemotherapy because of that targeted nature. And, you know, all treatments have side effects and the lutetium has some side effects as well. Uh, but it's fair to say that compared to sort of the blunderbuss chemotherapy approach, you know, it's much, much better tolerated. Yeah, I must admit, I had um, 65 gray of radiotherapy and then um, three doses of Cipspartan and I was violently ill for six months. It put me in hospital a couple of times. It's actually a fairly brutal pathway. So in the stories we hear about some of the pharaonostics patients are they have a dose and go home and everything's almost normal. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not actually the same sort of brutality that we get with some of the other um, would you say later stage treatment options that are available today? Um, so, sort of, I think we're we're getting to ten minutes to go. I wonder whether it's worth us asking if the audience has any questions. Um, I think um, all of those are fantastic uh, technology advances you're all working on, and um, I've I've been excited hearing about each of your work. Um, uh, have we got any questions that anybody wants to ask Rachel? Or Adina. Yeah, sorry about that. And, uh, yeah, I think yeah, I think, I think um, Ben Sand had a question up before. Yeah, Ben, welcome. I know one of your family members has just had some bad news. What are the um, best options for pancreatic cancer at the moment? Does anybody have any um, any views on it? I know this is not a diagnosis. We don't know what her case is, um, but is there any sort of advances we're seeing in this space at the moment? Look, for some types of pancreatic cancers called neuroendocrine tumours, we've actually been using this theranostic approach for some time. Yeah, pretty successfully so in the US, right? Yeah, so there's two types of pancreatic tumours. The most common one is an adenocarcinoma, but there's a less common one called neuroendocrine tumour. And uh, the neuroendocrine tumours is where our PSMA prostate cancer therapies have evolved from. Uh, there's a target similar to PSMA called dotatate that's expressed on the neuroendocrine cells, and we can use lutetium to treat those tumours. And we have a very large program at Peter Mac, but it's available right around Australia uh, to do this, and it really works very well. So it would depend on the type of pancreatic cancer, and more likely it's an adenocarcinoma 
where we don't have the theory. Yeah, that's that's that correct. Right. That's that's what it is. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, so the other so, questions, Mike, that came through, I mean, because I suppose I think you touched on it, that um, there is sort of an unequal distribution um, around Australia for cancer care. And I suppose it would be great to get um, the view of the panellists, um, this person's asked, on how, how can Australia, like what are the challenges and, and how can Australia see a more equitable distribution for some of these amazing, um, really amazing um, sort of an in, innovations? That, that's an interesting question. Um, um, look, I, I, in my view, having been through this stage, so I understand the, the journey very well, uh, you'll do anything. Um, and go anywhere to solve this problem if you're sort of later stage cancer sufferer. Ideally, it would be distributed everywhere in the world, in you know, rural, all over the place. But I think we have to start where the expertise is and work from there. Um, I mean, a lot of these radiation therapies will probably end up starting in major population centres close to where the originators of the radiation therapies are, right? Yeah, look, from my perspective, you know, there's a big team effort behind what we do in theranostics. You know, for our studies, these molecules have actually been made in hospital radiopharmacies. So there's a whole team behind the scenes preparing uh, what's happening. Uh, and uh, the expertise is really quite high, multiple specialties involved. Uh, so I think we do need large cancer hospitals, uh, but we do need to make them accessible. Probably what we can do better in Australia is link the networks together. So in the US, you have the NCI, the National Cancer sort of network, uh, NCN. Uh, that equivalent doesn't kind of exist in Australia. We've got Peter Mac and every state will have its own equivalent, maybe one, two or three of those. But we could do better in networking these all together, getting everyone collaborating together so that when you get one project open at one site, you can open it at you know 20 big sites around Australia. And uh, that would make some of these new technologies rapidly available. And we are doing that on the Theranostics uh, side. Fantastic. What else have we got here? I mean, I have a question from Tim Boyle from um, Ansto, who actually, I've been a happy customer of Ansto, uh, having received numerous doses of their um, FDG via PET scans. Thank you, Tim. Um, could you um, uh, use a laser for cell ablation as a treatment option that could be used in tandem with the OncoRes technology? Um, and I'll direct that one to you, Kath. Um, any views on that one? Thanks, Tim, for the question. Um, well, I guess uh, we are... Um, we haven't investigated that yet. That would be obviously something to investigate in the future. There's definitely a move towards, as we are getting better at diagnosing tumours earlier with liquid biopsies and with um, better scanning and better awareness in people, um, there are more treatment options that are being developed around cryoablation or laser ablation, particularly in lung cancer. Um, so it definitely seems to be um, something that will, I hope, be more prevalent in the future. And absolutely, we should be investigating whether or not we can work uh, in conjunction with something like that. And can I just do a shout out to Ansto as well? Because that image of the air, you know, the lutetium 177 is made by Ansto. And there aren't many lutetium manufacturers on the planet. And uh, we're really lucky to have one at Lucas Height. So, you know, it comes out of the medical research reactor and it's, you know, it really is a life-saving product that ANSTO is producing. Yeah, ANSTO is probably the unknown or under a, a lauded um, uh, entity in Australia for cancer treatment, that's for sure. Um, certainly there's a whole bunch of their work goes into um, helping keep cancer patients alive. Um, I, I'd just like to sort of um, start to bring this to a close. I want to say to the audience that just about everybody on the screen here is in one way or another, in some way, looking for help either from a research funding or from an investment perspective. And I'd encourage you all to sort of, if there are investors on the team to, uh, on the call, reach out to them if, if there's something that's interesting to you there. Um, I mean, one of the key challenges I think in this space is that they're actually 
is not enough research, um, either funding directly without sort of making a policy statement, it's just as an area where we could spend a lot of money on. Um, but also once you actually decide to jump out into a startup, there's a bit of a void there from a venture funding perspective. Um, in my mind, we're probably a billion and a half short of venture capital for medtech, therapeutics, uh, should I say therapeutics and diagnostics work. So um, if there's anybody out there that'd like to, um, to, to reach out to the team here, please do. Um, I, I'd like to thank the SLATS team. I'd like to thank our researchers, fantastic group of people, amazing. Please keep up the awesome work. Uh, we're going to stay on for a little bit longer now if anybody wants to ask any questions in a casual way. Um, some of our team have to drop. Um, Rachel, do you want to sort of do the yeah, formal wrap up? Thank you so much, Mike, and, and for all of the contributors so generously sharing with us today. I learned so much and I'm sure others did. And I'm also sort of consoled in a way that all this is happening. It's just it's just bloody amazing. So well done. And uh, thank you so much for sharing today. Um, we're going to stop the recording. And yes, please stay on the line um, to hear some more.